Hey there, listener. Brother, sister, I see you. This is Space Mummies from Planet X, and I'm the squong known as Devin Larson, fresh from the podcast Minds of Pandora with a nugget of unobtainium called an episode in the native tongue, ready to get all freaky with my braid feelers and have mind sex with an alien horse beast. That's right, we're talking Avatar this episode, but you knew that if you happen to glance at the episode title, so why be coy about it? I just saw The Way of Water, and I have thoughts. First, though, how you doing? How you been? It's been approximately a month since we last touched base, I think. With any luck, I'm recording this right around, possibly on, Christmas, so under even normal circumstances, this is a busy time of year, but I've got the new job thing, and I just moved, so yeah, who has time for anything? Octopath update. I haven't been playing much Octopath recently. I need to get back to it. Instead, I've been playing 2022's hot new game, Marvel's Spider-Man from 2018, in an effort to address the truly shameful backlog of games that I've been neglecting. Other than that, I caught all the way up on Titans and have been working my way through some of the other DC movies and shows that I've missed thanks to HBO Max. For instance, I hadn't seen James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. James Gunn is an entertaining and inspired filmmaker, which you would know if you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy or, like, anything he's made. And Suicide Squad was no exception. Kaiju Star of the Conqueror, need I say more. The main cast was delightful, and I was shocked at how great of an actor John Cena is. Imagine my further surprise when I discovered that they made a spin-off show for HBO Max called Peacemaker centered around his character. It came out this past year, and I recently binged the whole thing. Loved it. Legitimately funny, absurdist, with the expected moments of pathos you get with any serious anti-hero show about a killer that murders for peace. If you've got HBO Max, go watch it. I highly recommend it. On the anime front, I got way into the new show Spy Family about a pretend family in pseudo-Cold War Europe trying to infiltrate a prep school. The dad is a spy, the mom an assassin, and the only one who was actually aware of all of this is the adorable first-grade daughter who has telepathy. It's funny and super charming. Jojo Stone Ocean Part 3 dropped, and I devoured all of those episodes in a couple of days. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I love Jojo's Bizarre Adventure so goddamn much. I'm sad it's over, at least until they announce an adaptation for Steel Ball Run, but nothing lasts forever, I guess, even when it should. What else? I don't know, that's pretty much it, I think. Oh, um, I saw Bones and All in theaters a few weeks ago. That's the teen fiction cannibal movie with Timothy Chalamet. What a goofy-ass story, and not in a good way. It got so much critical praise at the time, probably as a result of the cinematography, but damn, feel free to skip it. You have my permission. And that's everything I've been up to lately. So enough delay. Let's get into it. Avatar, The Way of Water. As part of my preparation for this episode, I went back and watched Avatar 1 for the first time in years, since I saw it in theaters, to be perfectly honest with you. Way back in 2010, when I saw it, I didn't exactly hold it in the highest regard. This is me coming clean. Forgive me, father, and all that. It's not that I thought it was a bad movie by any means, it's just that by that point, the movie had been out for months and months and had been pretty impossible to score tickets for. Audiences were obsessed, particularly over the groundbreaking use of 3D, which would go on to be all the rage in filmmaking for a few years afterwards. People found Pandora beautiful and captivating, some to the point of feeling depressed that it was just a movie, if you believe the headlines. So finally, I saw it and thought, okay, this is pretty and kind of novel, but isn't this basically just dances with wolves with blue cat people? Which is admittedly reductive, but I felt the need to push back against how over-the-top people were being about it. Upon second viewing recently, I found I appreciated it a lot more, what it was trying to do, the beauty of the alien world it depicted. It's kind of hard to believe that the whole thing sprang more or less fully formed from the brain of a visionary director with the confidence and ability to actually get it made. I mean, it's such a specific weird thing. It's kind of incredible. And the name of that director? James fucking Cameron. You know him, you love him. James Cameron. Terminator, Aliens, Titanic. The man is a legend for good reason. Not only has he directed some of the highest grossing films of all time, He's widely recognized as an innovative director and has made contributions to science and environmentalism outside of his work in film. Born in 1954 in Ontario, Canada, his father was an electrical engineer, his mother an artist and nurse. 
He loved science fiction as a child. Already you can see where this is all coming from. At 17, the family moved to California, where James attended college for physics, before switching to English, before ultimately dropping out to drive trucks and write screenplays. In 1977, this little movie called Star Wars shifted the whole trajectory of his life. He quit driving trucks and borrowed some money from a consortium of dentists to write, direct, and produce his first film, a science fiction short called Xenogenesis. Xenogenesis is a pretty straightforward concept. In the distant future, an engineered man and woman set out in a sentient ship to look for a place to start a new life cycle for humanity. They encounter a derelict ship, explore it, and fight a giant robot cleaner. Cameron shot the whole thing in his living room, using self-taught film techniques. It was enough to get him noticed by New World Pictures, which hired him to work on several film projects, such as Battle Beyond the Stars, Escape from New York, Galaxy of Terror, and Android. During this period, he wore a number of hats. He was a model maker, a special effects director, and art director. Then for the movie Piranha 2 The Spawning, which came out in 1982, Cameron was initially once again tapped for the role of art director, but when the original director left the project citing creative differences, this provided Cameron with his first opportunity to step up and direct an honest-to-God feature-length film. It was a difficult project. The same power struggles over creative control with the producer that beset the original director also affected Cameron. The movie was shot in Rome, and at one point while suffering a fever, Cameron had a nightmare about an invincible robot hitman sent from the future to assassinate him, which would serve as the inspiration for his first hit film, the legendary The Terminator, 1984. Cameron wrote the screenplay for The Terminator in 1982 while crashing on a friend's floor drawing major inspiration from John Carpenter's Halloween, released in 1978, a few years prior. He took the script to his agent, who hated it, and told him to work on something else, so he fired his agent and kept shopping the script around to a number of studios, on the condition that he be also allowed to direct. This received a mixed reception, as a number of studio executives weren't willing to take a chance on letting a new director like Cameron make a movie like this. The project landed at Hemdale Pictures, later to be distributed by Orion following a deal that Cameron made, where he sold the rights for one dollar, provided he be allowed to direct. If you know anything about The Terminator, it may amuse you to know that Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't originally supposed to play the lead role. The first pick for the killer robot was O.J. Simpson. For real. With Schwarzenegger suggested as a possible choice for Kyle Reese. Cameron ultimately went with Schwarzenegger because he felt that Schwarzenegger's bodybuilder aesthetic more closely fit the role, and I guess at the time didn't think that O.J. Simpson felt menacing enough, which is funny. Um, The Terminator was a massive success, spawning a number of sequels, comics, and video games that continue to be produced to this day. It put James Cameron on the map as a capable and visionary director that could use cutting-edge special effects while writing and directing his own material. After co-writing the script for Rambo Part II, Cameron then pitched a sequel to Ridley Scott's Alien titled Aliens. There was some skepticism at the time about sequels being good or profitable, which, what a difference compared to nowadays, right? Not to mention that it had been seven years since the original Alien. Nevertheless, Cameron made a persuasive case, and the movie was greenlit. Making the film was a grueling process. This will become a recurring thing with Cameron Productions, as there was an almost immediate clash between the British production crew many of whom had worked on the original, and Cameron. Much of the tension centered around the daily tea breaks that the crew would take, something that frustrated Cameron to no end. He had this very specific vision for the film and would grow irate at the disruptions to the filming process. There were a number of firings, including the cinematographer, who complained about the shooting schedule, actor James Remar, uh, on account of a drug possession thing, and assistant director Derek Cracknell. Cameron experimented with a variety of special effects techniques. Uh, If you get a chance, go watch the the behind-the-scenes featurettes for Aliens. They're fascinating. And generally pushed the cast and crew to produce the best movie they could. The result? Another massive box office hit. Seven Academy Award nominations and two wins in sound editing and special effects. A case could be made that Aliens is a better movie than Alien, although they're two very different types of movies. I happen to fall on the side of thinking that Alien as a horror movie is a little bit better than the action movie direction of Aliens, but to each their own. Aliens further cemented Cameron as a master of science fiction 
and popularized the concept of the Space Marine. Other movies would then go on to explore the concept further, including Starship Troopers, Stargate, and later uh, a little movie called Avatar, which we'll get into in a bit, obviously. So following Aliens, Cameron turned his attention toward The Abyss, released in 1989 which was based on a story that he had written in high school. It's a movie about workers on an oil rig who discover an intelligent alien life in the ocean. The filming of The Abyss was a complete disaster, legendarily so. Most of the shooting took place in two huge water tanks in a decommissioned and never active nuclear power plant in South Carolina, which constantly sprang leaks. The shoot ran way over budget and placed a tremendous strain on both the cast and crew who were pushed to meet deadlines by a perfectionist and yelling James Cameron. There were a number of safety mishaps, and Harris nearly drowned at one point. One of the tanks became overchlorinated and bleached the diver's hair white. And through it all, Cameron was unyielding, insistent in pursuit of his vision to the point of being outright dictatorial. It's sort of like the dark side of his genius. He knows exactly what he wants and demands it. Screw the cost. The movie ended up missing its release window by a month had a middling box office take, and reception by audience and critics was muted. It received several Academy Award nominations and won one in special effects, but the result was generally considered a misfire and Cameron's reputation took a a small hit. It didn't slow down Cameron whatsoever, though, and his next film, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, saw the director back on top, redefining what was possible for a blockbuster action sci-fi sequel. It was a landmark film, way beyond what he had attempted with Aliens. Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton reunited to portray a story about a killer robot turned good, with Schwarzenegger's T-800 from the first film returning to the past to defend future leader John Connor from Robert Patrick's T-1000, a shape-shifting liquid metal robot that pushed the boundaries of special effects and the nascent use of CGI, stands for Computer Generated Imagery, on screen. We take CGI for granted these days because it's in everything. Every Marvel movie is a wash in it, and Avatar, as we'll get into later, I promise, is like 90% CGI, but T2 set the benchmark for all of that. Even though his previous movie, The Abyss, was a bit of a flop, Cameron had managed to test out this water-based CGI creature in it. This served as the underpinning for the T-1000 concept, only they made it opaque, metallic, and a central component of the movie. T2 basically started the summer blockbuster arms race, that held sway until, arguably, COVID. It was the highest grossing film that year, broke box office records for a rated R film, and won four Academy Awards. Then, in 1994, Cameron followed this up by writing and directing the film True Lies, once again starring Schwarzenegger as well as Jamie Lee Curtis about a married spy trying to hide his actual profession from his wife, who believes him to be a computer salesman. I don't have a lot to say about it. It's a charming movie that was well-received by fans and critics alike, with good reason. Then came the passion project that would go on to define James Cameron for well over a decade until Avatar, the Academy Award-winning Titanic, released in 1997. Cameron had always been fascinated with underwater exploration. I mean, look no further than his work on the abyss for evidence of that. The genesis of the project was the 1985 discovery of the wreck of the Titanic by Robert Ballard. Cameron had followed the discovery with great interest, and after watching a National Geographic special on Ballard, he began jotting down notes on how he would go about structuring a movie based on it, with the narrative of the disaster bookended by present-day salvage footage and the memory of a survivor to give things an air of personal mystery. It was a huge production, the most expensive movie ever made at the time, at around $200 The majority of it was shot at a specially constructed studio in Mexico with a 17 million gallon water tank and a 775-foot replica of the Titanic. It was one of the first films to integrate motion capture, CGI, and stunt work in a way that thoroughly blurred the line between what was real and what was CGI. Additionally, many of the standard lighting, rigging, and filming techniques that were used on other movies proved to be completely impractical on the set of Titanic, leading to widespread improvisations with dollying and so forth. Cameron created backstories for over 150 extras on the film based on the real-life people that were on the wreck when it went down. Up until it released, Many were predicting a a flop. Studio execs couldn't envision such a long movie, its ultimate runtime was 3 hours 15 minutes, with such a massive price tag being profitable, let alone recouping the production costs. And it was a love story. Absurd. Except, 
If you were around at the time, you know how things turned out. Massive success, number one at the box office for 15 consecutive weeks, something that will never happen again. Highest grossing film of all time until Avatar broke the record over a decade later. Academy Award juggernaut with 14 nominations and 11 wins. So what do you do after that? Well, Cameron then took a break from directing feature films for a while. He developed the series Dark Angel for TV and then spent the early to mid-2000s working on documentaries. He mostly stayed with underwater exploration stuff, focusing on marine life. Uh, There were two separate documentaries on the Titanic, etc. One of those Titanic documentaries, by the way, Ghosts of the Abyss, released by Disney for theaters in 3D. During an interview with The Guardian, Cameron announced his intention to film everything in 3D going forward, which he was true to his word. James Cameron movies all seem to center on the relationship between man, machine, and nature in some way or another. What does it mean to be human? What forms of life are deserving of respect? He clearly sees the value in strong female protagonists, as demonstrated by his two Terminator movies and Aliens, among others. Aliens, and later Avatar, examine the military-industrial complex. Cameron clearly has a deep pessimism or cynicism when it comes to the military and how it prioritizes blind obedience over free thought to the detriment of life and dignity toward all manner of living things. The same can be said about corporations, which come across as equally morally bankrupt as the military. The profit motive is a corrupting influence, and we denigrate ourselves in pursuit of it. To Cameron, technology is a double-edged sword. When used for good, it can expand the limits of human consciousness, cause people and nature itself to flourish, but it can just as easily enslave and destroy. Technology has no innate morality, it's merely a tool. There's also this element of star-crossed romance that pops up again and again in his work. Titanic, for instance. Two young people from different socioeconomic stations finding each other, but doomed to lose it all in the end. Avatar has this too. In fact, let's get into it, shall we? So James Cameron's Avatar, which is the actual title, came to the director in a dream, much the same as his inspiration for the movie The Terminator. At 19, while attending Fullerton Junior College, Cameron had this dream about a giant bioluminescent forest with trees that look like fiber optic lamps and purple moss that glows when you walk on it. He drew a picture of this, which incidentally ended up saving him a ton of headaches later when people tried to claim copyright infringement, and then he just filed the idea away for later. He resurfaced the idea sometime around 1994 when Cameron revisited the concept and began writing a treatment for the film that ran around 80 pages. Originally, the idea was to begin work on Avatar immediately after the completion of Titanic. However, the technology just wasn't there to achieve Cameron's vision, so he once again set the idea aside and turned to focus on the TV and documentary projects I talked about earlier. Then, in 2005, he started developing the fictional language of the Navi, and the following year actively developing the fictional universe and wrote the screenplay. You're already probably familiar with what the film is about, but let me run through it anyway. Avatar concerns a forested moon in the Alpha Centauri system called Pandora that houses an untold wealth of natural resources, along with a spiritual native alien culture called the Navi. The Navi are a blue humanoid cat-like people with an intimate bond to nature. All things on planet Pandora make up this network of energy that the Navi worship, which they call Awa. At some point in the past, this harmony was shattered by the arrival of humans. They came in pursuit of a super mineral called unobtainium. No, really. And immediately set about strip mining the landscape in order to extract unobtainium in large quantities. This, understandably, met resistance from the Navi. They attack the human invaders in order to protect their home, which prompts a dual response from the humans. First, they try to create schools in order to civilize the Navi. When that doesn't work, they resort to force. Enter Jake Sully, the protagonist of the film. A veteran who lost the use of his legs, Jake is brought into a program whereby genetically engineered Navi bodies are controlled remotely by human operators. At first, his mission is simple. Ingratiate himself with the Navi in order to gain intelligence that can be used to exploit them, but... Before long, Sully finds himself brought into the forest-dwelling Navi tribe, the Omadikaya, and trained to walk, hunt, and fly as they do. He falls in love with Neytiri, the chieftain's daughter. He falls in love with the planet. When a sizable deposit of unobtainium is found beneath the sacred tree of the Navi, 
Sully switches sides and fights with the Navi against the human invaders. He organizes a massive uprising of the various Navi tribes and employs military tactics against the humans. They are eventually able to overpower the humans and drive them from the planet. As a reward, Jake is permanently bonded to his avatar body through a mind link from the sacred tree. That's the gist of it, anyway. I mean, it's over three hours long. There is one thing I wanted to bring up that really didn't fit elsewhere in my notes, so I wanted to talk about it here. The sex scene. The what, you say? Sex and Avatar? I don't remember that at all. I know, but it did happen. So here's the deal. In the original theatrical cut of Avatar, Sully and Neytiri have this romantic moment where they link hair tendrils, which are these feeler things that the Navi use to connect to everything, and it's clearly sensual and they're clearly having sex. It suggests all these weird complications like, are they screwing the animals that they ride on? Um, They link feelers in exactly the same way. If you were to go watch the movie now on Disney Plus or wherever, they've edited that part of the scene out, presumably to make it more appealing to a broader audience, which I get, but it led to this weird Mandela effect where some people remember the sex scene and some don't. Anyway, moving on. The first thing that most people probably will point to about Avatar that was remarkable is its use of 3D, and I do want to talk about that in a second, but I wanted to pause and point out something a little more fundamental. James Cameron created a vibrant alien ecosystem and put it on film. Think about that for a second. Pandora doesn't exist. He made that shit up with computers and filmed a movie there, starring blue cat people, and it feels authentic. I feel like that gets taken for granted, but it's an amazing achievement. Then there's the technical aspect of it. Most of the movie is CGI, including a majority of the characters. The fact that it all feels cohesive due to a combination of motion capture and post-process CGI, as well as real actors, is pretty groundbreaking. Cameron ended up having to invent a number of new technologies just to be able to film the movie, including the fusion camera system to shoot everything in 3D, and a virtual camera that allowed him to see CGI characters in real time in order to adjust his shots, which honestly sounds like magic to me. I'm not sure how they were able to do that since most CGI happens after the shooting is over with. But the truly crazy thing at the time was the 3D. It's an old technology that's been around for a while in a rudimentary form. Think those red and blue 3D glasses that make stuff seem like it was popping out of the screen a bit. Kind of a fad that didn't really take off at the time. Cameron took it to the next level. The 3D in Avatar is subtle, convincing, and it doesn't make the movie this weird two-tone red-blue color. As a result, the 3D upped the immersion factor even more, which made Pandora feel that much more real to audiences. So creating Avatar was, understandably, a massive undertaking. It's the distillation of one man's vision on screen, something that required, as I said, completely new filmmaking techniques in order to bring it all to life. In addition to the fusion camera system and the virtual camera, they also needed a special camera on the boom to record facial expressions, which would then be mapped to the digital characters. Rendering everything required massive amounts of data storage and over 900 people behind the scenes. It required a 10,000 square foot server farm to process the data. Each minute of footage for Avatar requires 17 plus gigabytes of storage. The runtime was also a point of concern for the studio execs, by the way. There's this funny story about Cameron on the set of Avatar where this exec tried to talk to him about making the movie shorter and he cursed the guy out and made him leave the set. There's that personable James Cameron charm. Gotta love it. The movie ended up costing a lot. $237 million by many estimates, although the numbers can be a little fuzzy, though it more than made up for it at the box office. Although more on that in a minute. Avatar is a pretty straightforward movie as far as the actual story goes. It's an examination of the tensions between man and nature, corporate greed and spirituality. Militarism, patriotism, and imperialism, and xenophobia, they all feature prominently. It's about respect for the environment, an allegory for how we despoil our own planet in a reckless, unthinking way. It's also about realizing that all living things are connected and that by hurting our world, we hurt ourselves in the process. The destruction of a tree in Avatar represents an emotional loss for the audience. Average Hollywood stakes like life or death for individual humans matter far less. It's pretty remarkable, actually. So people went bananas for James Cameron's Avatar, like I mentioned in the beginning. 
It was hard to get tickets for a while after the movie came out. It was just too popular. People kept flocking to the theater to see it. In the end, it earned $2.92 billion worldwide, the highest grossing film of all time until Avengers Endgame in 2019, second only to Gone with the Wind when adjusted for inflation. Critics and audiences alike praised the movie for its groundbreaking use of CGI. The story was criticized for being a little bland, too similar to Pocahontas or Dances with Wolves, I guess, despite its many strong themes, which did arguably set it apart. If you go check, it currently sits at 82% on Rotten Tomatoes for both critics and audiences. There was also this weird thing that started popping up, which I mentioned before uh, online in the wake of Avatar's theatrical release, this thing that they dubbed post-Avatar depression syndrome. I don't know how real this actually was versus just some online rumor. However, people started reporting feeling depressed and unsatisfied with their lives after experiencing the world of Pandora and Avatar. I don't know. That sounds crazy to me. Avatar jump-started the 3D craze of the early 2010s. Suddenly, theaters had to upgrade or retrofit their theaters for 3D. Every major movie release needed a 3D version. It affected home theater setups as new TVs would include 3D as a feature. It was everywhere for a few years because everyone wanted to capitalize on that Avatar magic. I guess making almost $3 billion is kind of an irresistible prize. All of the novel CGI techniques that Cameron created for the film would then make their way into other movies like Star Wars or the MCU. It also affected the release window for future movies. Up until that point, the summer blockbuster was king, and the winter months were considered a dead zone for new releases. Avatar, released in December of 2009, changed that perception. Summer blockbusters continued to be a thing, but ever since, studios have embraced the winter months as a viable window for big movie releases because... Turns out, people like watching movies in December, too. Shocking, I know. So, Avatar comes out, is this massive hit, and then Cameron waits 13 years to release a sequel. Why? Well, it's much the same answer as to why did the first movie take so long to make. Technology needed to catch up. In the interim, Cameron built a submersible, and in 2012 explored the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the lowest place on Earth, and something that nobody had done since 1960. When he returned to development on The Way of Water, it took five years alone for the production team to design the new underwater environment in the new tribe of Navi, the Metkayina. Cameron had to invent new cameras, yet again, to accurately capture facial expressions when filming underwater. All of the actors involved had to contend with the innate difficulty of filming underwater, which echoes the abyss, but presumably safety standards are higher these days than they were then, one would hope. This meant holding their breaths underwater for long periods of time, since scuba gear and bubbles would interfere with the shots. After the long gap between Avatar and the Way of Water, Cameron had no intention of letting that kind of time pass between future Avatar sequels because, make no mistake, he has this far-reaching vision for Avatar as a franchise. As a result, Cameron prepared not only for Avatar 2, but also Avatars 3 through 5 in a way that puts the Lord of the Rings shooting schedule to shame. So while working on The Way of Water, they've already shot footage simultaneously for Avatars 3 and 4, which will release in 2024 and 2026, respectively. Expect Avatar 5 in 2028. So I hope you like Blue Cat people, because we'll be seeing a lot of them. So here are my relatively spoiler-free thoughts on The Way of Water, which I saw a few days ago. I'm going to attempt to keep things as nonspecific as possible because it's a new movie and I really do recommend you go see it. It's, it's good. So the movie is definitely an evolution from the first film. Sully and Neytiri have children, and therefore a very personal stake in the fighting to come. They have a family to protect, something to lose. The conflict feels very similar to the first movie, like it's going through much of the same motions all over again. The change of location to focusing on the ocean-dwelling Metkayina is a bold choice that pays off. The environment feels richer, more full of life. I could feel a much stronger connection between the Navi and the sea creatures around them than I ever could with the forest animals in the first movie. So a significant part in the way of water is its allegory for whale hunting, how humans treat the lives of animals as disposable and the tragedy that that represents. There's also this weird plot thread about the paternity of one of the children that's dangled throughout the movie and then just never gets resolved. It's weird. 
Presumably the answer will come in one of the upcoming sequels, but it's bewildering here. Mostly, the movie centers around the kids, how they make their way through the world and try to live up to their parents' expectations. It's a highly impressive movie, technically. The set piece near the end with the sinking craft is magnificent. The ultimate resolution of the conflict, though, doesn't come by the end, which can feel a little bit cheap from a narrative standpoint. I guess you gotta leave something for Avatar 3. I also felt that the movie was a bit too long. I know, come yell at me, James. But I don't know what it is these days with two and a half to three hour movies. Nobody feels like they need to edit or be concise anymore. Everything drifts towards indulgence. But the main takeaway is, I did like it. The film is an achievement, beautiful, nearly as good as the first, which is not a criticism. Avatar 1 was just that good. I rate it 4 out of 5 flippers, so go see it if you have the time. So far, the reaction to the movie has been largely positive. Early impressions by critics universally praise the technical achievement and special effects of the movie, some contending that the character development is stronger or more sophisticated than the original. Currently, it's rocking a 93% Rotten Tomatoes score for audiences, so it sounds like the general reaction has been an enthusiastic affirmative from the layman. Will it earn $2 billion at the box office when all is said and done, which is the figure that Cameron himself has said that it needs to earn to break even? Yeah, that remains to be seen. Over the course of researching for this episode, and looking back over James Cameron's filmography and achievements, I'm left with one inescapable conclusion. The man is a visionary genius. Few can match his contributions to filmmaking. He's responsible for so many technical innovations, pioneering the use of CGI and motion capture, 3D, always pushing the boundaries of what's possible in film. The man created hit after hit, defined the very concept of the high-budget blockbuster, and has pursued his craft fearlessly in the face of any and all obstacles. Consider this. Who but James Cameron could get not one, but two expensive CGI movies made about blue space cats. Three hour-long movies with anti-corporate pro-environmentalist messaging. Who would even try? And that's the episode. Or as they say in the V. Yeah, I have no idea. What, you actually thought I was going to quote something there? (laughs) Thanks for listening. It's the 10th episode. I can't believe it. I've actually done 10 of these things. Which does bring me to a bit of an announcement. The show is going on hiatus for a bit. I know, I know. It's such a good show. Why would you do this to me, Devin? What am I supposed to listen to now? What can I say? Life gets complicated, you know? I moved. I'm working full time. I'm trying to have this voiceover career thing. And then there's this podcast, which I love doing. But boy, it's a surprising amount of work. All the time I spend researching, editing, etc., If it was just talking about stuff and nothing else, I'd do it every week. But, alas, it's taking up a bit too much of my time, so I've got to prioritize. I'm calling this the end of Season 1 of Space Mummies from Planet X. It's not the end of the show, because it's fun and I want to keep doing it, but for now, for right now, the show is going on a break. I don't have an exact ETA for when you can expect more episodes. I wish I could tell you that, but I honestly don't know the timeline. I need to be able to juggle my day job with my voiceover work and have time left over for podcast research. I might tweak the format so I don't need as much time to prepare, or I may plan out a number of episodes and record them all in one go. I have no idea. All I can say is, keep an eye out on the podcast feed. I'll let you know when I know. In the meantime, I'll continue to update the YouTube channel about once a month with new tutorial videos. I'm also planning some additional content for the channel, so... Look forward to that in the future. And at some point, Space Mummies will return for Season 2. So until next time, whenever that is, be good to yourselves.